Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the 18th World Conference on Tobacco or Health webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Tackling Illicit Tobacco During COVID-19 Pandemic. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few features that will allow you to take part in today's event. When joining the webinar, you will prompt to set up your audio. By default, the platform selects your computer's mic and speakers. If you prefer joining over the telephone, please select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Please note that you are joining in a listen-only mode, which means that you are muted throughout the webinar. However, during our session, you will have the opportunity to engage with our panelists by submitting your text questions in the questions pane. You may send them at any time during the presentation. We will collect and address these questions during the Q&A segment at the end of our panelists' presentation. Now, without further ado, I am pleased to welcome our webinar moderator, Mr. Rodrigo Santos Fejo, who is a program manager at the Secretariat of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, where he provides support to the implementation of the protocol to eliminate, to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products. He holds an MSc in Health, Community and Development from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Mr. Santos Fejo has over 15 years of professional experience in project management, public health, and communication. This includes roles as project officer with the Pan American Health Organization, social communication analyst at the National Cancer Institute of Brazil, as well as consultants for the World Bank and Inter American Development Bank. Over to you, Rodrigo, and welcome. Thank you, Joanna, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. This webinar is organized by the Union and the 18th World Conference on Tobacco or Health Scientific and Track Committees. I'm pleased to welcome the speakers joining me on today's session, Dr. Anna Ross, Dr. MJ Valavan, and Dr. Luke Johnson. Our first speaker, Dr. Hannah Ross, we will discuss illicit trade and lockdowns, the case of South Africa. Hannah received a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and she is currently a principal research officer, professor level, at the research unit on the economics of excisable products at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Ross studies the economic impact of tobacco control interventions, including excise tax policies in Africa, Southeast Asia, and in the European Union. She also works on issues related to illicit trade in tobacco and alcohol, including measuring the size of tax avoidance, evasion, and strategies to control the illegal cigarette and alcohol markets. Dr. Hannah Ross, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for this uh, nice introduction. And welcome, everybody, to today's webinar. So I will uh, be sharing with you a story of South Africa and its situation during the lockdown. Um, the work that I'm going to present is pretty much a teamwork, uh, team efforts work uh, from uh, my research unit on economics of excisable products. So I would like to thank uh, my colleagues for contribution to these results. Um, so um, South Africa banned uh, a cigarettes uh, sale in response to um, COVID-19 and it's um, the ban started uh, on March 27, and it lasted almost five months till August 17, 2020. So it was uh, the rationale for the sales ban was to prevent serious illness during, uh, um, um, you know, among smokers who might be more severely infected, impacted by COVID-19, and therefore ease the pressure on the healthcare sector. But there was also a second. Um, 
reason added later on that was to prevent smokers from sharing cigarettes, which is a common practice in South Africa. Other countries that also had a sales ban uh, during uh, their initial response to COVID-19 were Botswana and India, but those sales ban lasted much shorter time than in South Africa, only 12 weeks and six weeks and in, in Botswana and India respectively. So um, South Africa unfortunately started the sales ban in a situation where it already had a pretty large and lucrative illicit cigarette market. Um, the studies that my, uh, me and my colleagues have done in South Africa showed that in 2017, um, at least one third, if not 40% of the market was represented by illegal products or products that were not taxed. Um, and therefore, even though situation started to improve a little bit in 2019, this was not a good setup for instituting a sales ban. So did it work? Did the sales ban work? Here you have a few images from South Africa. As you can see, that wasn't really the case. So this uh, inspired uh, my colleagues to uh, do a survey among smokers and ask them, you know, how they, respond, uh, how they responded to the sales ban. So South Africa, um, before the sales ban, had about 20% smoking prevalence. Now among the smokers, the survey found that about 9% of the smokers quit. And most of them during the first uh, weeks of the sales ban. And most of them probably due to the health scare. But then out of these uh, uh, smokers who quit, two thirds were planning to stay quit even though now we, as we see the reality when the sales ban was lifted, we see that this response or the quitting was, was much lower than uh, reported during the survey. So, um, and also 93% of smokers could purchase cigarettes despite the ban. And because of these restrictions, because of the sales ban, the average price of cigarette increased dramatically by about 250% on average uh, compared to the prices before the uh, sales ban. So where were smokers getting their cigarettes? Not in the formal retail shops. So you hear the first, uh, um, the first line here is their re former retail shops and you can see that very few of them were getting that from formal uh, retail, retailers. Most of the uh, cigarettes during the sales ban were obtained from informal sectors like espaza shops, which are little stores mostly uh, present in townships. You also see um, 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 occurrence of WhatsApp groups that we are now um, uh, also starting to distribute cigarettes during the sales ban. And a lot of people were obtaining cigarettes from their friends and family. So what was a mistake also during this time was that manufacturers were in fact allowed to produce for export. And we believe that export increased dramatically and we believe that a lot of this export really never left the country or came back from abroad. There were pictures of cross-border runners showed on, on in different medias where people from uh, neighboring countries were bringing cigarettes on their backs to South Africa. And um, also many, many ordinary citizens now got involved in the distributing these illegal products because of the worsening economic crisis or situation during the pandemic. So all this sort of contributed to quite a, a lively illegal cigarette market in South Africa during the sales ban. So what we also observe is a, a, a brand switching. Uh, so before uh, the sales ban, about two thirds of the market was uh, occupied by um, cigarettes produced by multinational companies. But during the sales ban, a lot of people who usually um, uh, smoke these international brands are now switched to local uh, cigarettes. About 46% of these people now were switch, switched, smokers switched from uh, international brands to local brands. So in the end, after you know, during the sales ban, the uh, multinationals occupied probably just one third of the market, which was uh, uh, quite a you know a different it sort of a setup, a very different uh, situation for these multinationals. And um, so um, what we also have seen that smoking intensity among people dropped. 
you know, as I mentioned, the price went up substantially people switched to cheaper local brands in a response, but also uh, reduced the number of cigarettes they smoke per day uh, slightly, from 10 cigarettes per day to nine cigarettes per day. So just to what happened, you know, just to summarize the, the real impact of the sales ban. So in fact, the sales ban was supposed to prevent cigarette sharing. We in fact have seen more cigarette sharing during the uh, sales ban. Smokers now were more likely to be exposed to COVID because they had to, uh, they have extra effort to search for their cigarettes during the sales ban. And the trust in the government was undermined. For example, now when the sales ban was lifted on tobacco products, water pipes are not banned. And those, as you know, uh, are shared in the cafe and that could be a very good source of COVID. So for some reason, Water pipes are not banned now in South Africa. And also the court found the government uh, response uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to COVID-19 un unconstitutional and unnecessary. So the ban was found unnecessary. At the same time, there were new illegal distribution channels that developed in South Africa, and those will be very difficult to control now. We see a, a new criminal syndicates being involved because now we really reali we realized how much of a profit can be made on cigarette sales. So, and and uh, um, the revenue authority, because of the sales ban, lost about 5.8 billion rand, about 400 million dollars. So it was a huge uh, loss for the fiscus. And um, at the same time, the profit uh, acquired by criminals is now going to be invested into um, more developing these uh, distribution channels and also circumventing the tax administration. The previously dominant uh, market share was by BAT, British American Tobacco, but that uh, BAT lost the dominance. So what, we, uh, what we, uh, we think might happen, there could be some kind of a price war, even though in terms of prices actually post sales ban, we see that prices of all cigarettes uh, increased dramatically. Um, uh, the local brands increased by about 30%. So we were hoping that this price increase will motivate tax authorities to increase tax because they now realize that there is a room in the cigarette prices for you know more taxes. But in fact, South Africa increased their taxes only by 8% this year. So not enough to um, take advantage of this space that was kind of revealed by the sales ban. And the other thing that happened is that because now the local uh, manufacturers increased their prices, one of the methodology that we used to determine um, uh, illegal sale was by price. When the price was less than a tax amount, we were, uh, we, uh, were marking these packs as illegal. But now as the price went up, all prices, uh, most of the price is now above the tax level. And therefore that method that we used prior to the sales ban is no longer uh, apl applicable for us. So what is the recommendation? The, what we would recommend a South African government to quickly ratify the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products, to introduce track and trace system that would be independent from the industry, and impose uh, export taxes on tobacco products. We also, we also need to increase sanctions for tobacco tax evasion. And uh, last but not least, the government need to substantially increase tobacco tax to boost public health health and to make up for the revenue loss that was sustained during the sales ban. So that's all for me. Thank you very much and my colleagues and back to you, Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Hannah. Very interesting findings indeed. Uh, I just want to remind our participants that uh, if they want to we are going to have some time for questions and answers at the end of this session, but if you already want to put some questions while the presenters are speaking, just please do so in the questions pane and we will try to answer, uh, to answer them at the end. So uh, we move now to India's efforts to implement the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products. Our speaker, Dr. Valavan, who is an officer of the 1995 batch, 
working as commissioner in Central Board of Indirect Taxes and Customs. He's also looking after Customs Single Window Project of CBIC. He has served in the Central Excise and Customs Field Formations and DRI. He also worked as Undersecretary and Director in the Ministry of Finance. Dr. Valavan was part of a working group under the Canadian International Development Agency project for reforming the central excise and service tax in India in the early 2000s. He assisted the Task Force on Indirect Taxes in 2002, Task Force on CAD Restructuring in 2002, and the Task Force to Review Customs Act in 2017. He received a presidential award in 2017 a holder of a Bachelor in Veterinary Science and a Master's in Economics. Dr. Valavan has done postgraduate program in public policy and management from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. He underwent training and capacity building programs from the premier international institutes, such as the IIM Bangalore, IIM Lucknow, Maxwell School, London School of Economics, Judd Business School, and Niran Road University. Dr. Valavan participated in multilateral workshops and conferences in Sri Lanka, Kenya, Czech Republic, United Kingdom, and Switzerland. Dr. Valavan, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Good morning and good evening to all of you. I'll just uh, go through my presentation on how India went about uh, in implementation of the protocol to eliminate illicit trade. Uh, are you able to see my presentation on screen? Yes, we are. Thank are you, you able to see my presentation? Yeah, we are. So, uh, we all know about WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, uh, basically aimed at demand reduction and uh, price and uh, tax measures, support for viable alternatives, and elimination of illicit trade. And uh, uh, consequently, uh, before the convention, India has enacted comprehensive uh, act called Control of Tobacco Product Acts 2003. And Article 215 of the FCTC talks about illicit trade, smuggling, and counterfeiting. And the protocol, the main objective and scope, we are all aware that there are three substantive parts, preventive illicit trade and controlling supply chain. Second is law enforcement. Third is international cooperation. Part three of the protocol is called as the heart of the protocol which talks about uh, various measures on licensing system, due diligence, tracking and tracing, record creeping, security and preventive measures in uh, by persons in supply chain, sales by internet, controls in free zones, and duty-free sales. But India has become party uh, to the protocol in 2000. Uh, 18 uh, before uh, just before uh, the mop one and and accordingly is by, bound by implementation of various provisions of this protocol as well so just to give a glimpse of uh, illicit trade in cigarettes in india and tobacco in general the tobacco industry illicit cigarette in the market increased the industry claims the, this is what industry claims that uh, illicit market increased from 15 to 24 percent uh, during 2010 and 2015. But uh, uh, after uh, repeated attempts to find what is the source of this uh, finding, uh, 
nobody was able to answer in affirmative what was the source of this uh, 15 to 25% illicit trade uh, account. So uh, we have uh, parallelly, we have uh, two other studies. One is uh, conducted by WHO uh, by Mark uh, Goodchild. It says illicit uh, market in India accounted for 6% of the total cigarette consumption in 2016 and 17. Uh, this Marx uh, Goodchild study was based on the um, uh, <coughs> licit, uh, the consumption survey and licit production based on the tax figures. So the retail value of illicit cigarette mark has arrived at 49 billion rupees or US dollar 753 million. And uh, the tax uh, loss because of this illicit, illicit trade is sort of around 25 billion rupees or 390 million US dollars. A similar study by John and Ross in 2018 illicit trade in india they found that illicit trade in india generally very low that is on uh, it is all over india it was 2.7 percent this study is based on uh, empty pocket survey method and uh, that is where uh, india stands on illicit trade so <clears throat> coming to the task before india uh, after access in to the illicit trade protocol the uh, we have to, uh, as per the protocol, we have to establish track and trace system within five years for cigarettes and uh, within 10 years for other tobacco products. And we also have to uh, put in place a system for controls, better controls in free zones within three years of entry into force. So uh, how India went ahead. India, before uh, this thing, we have a track and tracing system in a, in a primitive form for pharmaceuticals. And uh, the state government of Delhi has developed a op and operationalized track and trace system for liquor. And what we decided in India is a tracking and tracing system for cigarette should be better implemented if it is uh, placed under central excise laws. And we also visualized the possibility of uh, empowering officers of other department and ministries to seize the illicit cigarettes under Customs Act as well when it uh, comes to cross-border smuggling. Accordingly, uh, our board under the Ministry of Finance in consultation with the uh, uh, Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare formed a working group to chart out the modalities of the tracking and tracing system that India should adapt. So these are all the broad roadmap uh, the working group has uh, uh, drawn. Uh, in the first two years, we went uh, on studying the various tracking and tracing systems that are in place in different countries for different purposes, sourcing and analyzing the legal and procedural issues in the implementation of tracking and tracing system drafting a detailed legal framework and proposals for creating the requisite administrative setup and infrastructure that is required for implementation of tracking and tracing system. So in the third year, uh, we have uh, suggested that we should go for stakeholders consultation on legal, procedural and administrative issues arising out of the proposals made by the working group. And in the fourth year, uh, subject sub, uh, subject to minor changes, if at all anything warranted, uh, we will go to the parliament and get the law enacted, amending the Central Excise Act and Customs Act wherever necessary. And uh, the once uh, that uh, law is enacted, uh, we have a time for actual implementation process, that is tendering process, including inviting the letter of intent, finalization of tender, and tender evaluation and identification of service provider and award of contract, industry preparation for creation of necessary physical and IT infrastructure in coordination with the service providers, pilot testing, and full launch of actual launch of tracking and tracing system for cigarettes. 
So uh, in terms of the roadmap, what we have done is we have studied the, the best practices. Um, we could get uh, the Kenya model. In fact, uh, before we um, become party to the protocol, a team of officers visited Kenya and studied how Kenya has implemented tracking and tracing system uh, in under their Central Excise, Excise Act. And with the help of WHO, we could organize a webinar in uh, 2020 uh, with Brazil and European Union uh, officials. Though, and during those webinars, they have shared their practices and what they are following for a tracking and tracing system. And besides these webinars, we also collected a lot of literatures, including the one which was prepared by Hannah Ross. And based on these materials, working group deliberated in detail what system India should adopt. So I'm, uh, I was told um, I, the, <clears throat> the Kenya, Brazil, and uh, EU systems, I am just skipping these slides because um, I, I don't know much to say because it's already there. And the last one is uh, just a comparative uh, chart of uh, what we have analyzed. So uh, the various features we have uh, analyzed, mechanism, product level implementation, security features, data in the uh, unique identifier and, or tax stamp, verification of the production line, machine identifiable identifier code equipment to count the output products for home consumption product for export imported goods verification by retailers data collection and storage these are all the features we compared the eu kenya and brazil models and uh, uh, more or less uh, we have taken the best features of all these three models and uh, the working group has finalized its report uh, suggesting uh, major recommendations number one india as uh, it became the party to the protocol has to implement the tracking and tracing system put in place the tracking and tracing system on a time bound manner as mandated by the protocol and we have suggested the draft set of uh, amendment to the central excise act and customs act and also the working groups has uh, given the draft set of rules under central excise act and customs act uh, besides the working group also gave recommendations on how to operationalize uh, the tracking and tracing system once these laws are enacted. So we propose to uh, create a separate directorate to function as authorized officer to look after all the uh, issues relating to tracking and tracing. And that directorate will be mandated to uh, float the tender consult the industry and uh, implement uh, the tracking and tracing system in future. So that's about uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Balaban. I think it's very encouraging to see that uh, even with all the challenges that we are facing because of the COVID-19 pandemic, India is still proceeding and, and putting a lot of efforts to implement the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products. Thank you. So um, challenges and opportunities for the, illicit, the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products will now be discussed by our last speaker Mr. Luke Jonsens. Luke has long been 
a leading expert on the illicit trade and has been a prominent figure in the European tobacco control community for more than 30 years. He has written numerous academic articles against international bodies, including the World Bank, the European Commission, the World Health Organization, the World Customs Organization, and the Food and Drug Administration. He was one of the reporters of the WHO expert group on illicit trade, illicit tobacco trade, sorry, in 2007, which prepared a template for a protocol in illicit trade. He attended all the IMBs, which negotiated the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products. His expertise on the illicit trade and cigarette smuggling is cemented in the catalog of academic articles that he has altered and co-altered since the early 90s. Together with Martin Raw, he developed the tobacco control scale and quantified the implementation of tobacco control policies at country level based on evidence of effectiveness. In 1991, he received the World Health Organization Commemorative Award and Medal for promoting the concept of tobacco-free societies. In 2006, he received the American Cancer Society Luther Terry Award for outstanding individual leadership in tobacco control. And in 2015, the World Health Organization Director General's special recognition of contribution to global tobacco control. Look. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you much, Rodrigo. It's my pleasure and honor to make a presentation on the challenges and opportunities for the illicit trade protocol in COVID times. Next. So the protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products exists now for six years, it was adopted in Seoul 12 November 2000, 2012 entry into force in September 2018. We have already 62 parties and the ambition of the protocol is very ambitious, the elimination of illicit trade in tobacco products. How will they do this? So the aim is to control the supply chain and to promote international cooperation uh, among parties. Next slide. So we have now 62 parties and some important parties have ratified the ITP, such as Brazil, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Pakistan, India, uh, France, Germany, UK, the European Union. So that's an impressive list of countries. Next one. But some parties are still missing. If you look, for instance, at the data on seizures from the World Customs Organization, you will notice that some of the important countries are still missing, such as China, um, Russian Federation, um, South Africa, Paraguay, or even Korea, where the protocol has been adopted. So there is still progress to make. Next slide. The problem in COVID times is the impact on the uh, problems with the economy and the economy uh, shrunk by 4% last year. This raises all kinds of financial problems and it will be more difficult uh, for countries to implement policies. Next slide. However, if we eliminate illicit cigarette trade, such as determined by the protocol, this will raise revenue. Based on data from 2007, we estimated that the losses to cigarette, illicit cigarette trade uh, was 10 year, 13 years ago, 40 billion US dollars. If there was no more illicit trade, the price of illicit cigarettes which would go up, consumption would go down, but still governments would gain at least $31 billion. So it's very profitable for governments if you eliminate illicit cigarette trade. Next slide. A new study undertaken by the WHO Health Economist uh, found that 
the elimination of illicit cigarettes in 36 countries with solid data independent from the tobacco industry uh, that tax revenue would raise by 11 percent so all the evidence shows that if you eliminate um, illicit trade the price of the illicit cigarette would go up consumption would go down but you would still gain a lot of money next slide what are now the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities and the threat of the illicit trade protocol so it's clear that we have um, a legal instrument and that the international collaboration and more enforcement are effective to combat illicit trade and in COVID times, it's also important that the elimination of illicit trade could raise revenue and could be part of the COVID-19 recovery strategy of the party. What is the weakness of the ITP? Weakness is the lack of expertise of health officials on illicit trade in general and traceability specifically. And that due to COVID, uh, capacity building becomes more complicated and also the FCTC decision-making process. For instance, the meeting of the parties was postponed by one year. What is the opportunity of the ITP? Tracking and tracing and supply control measures are strong obligations in the ITP and we should use them. And what's the threat? Well, the threat is the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry is proposing their own traceability system, which they control and the uh, company in Nexto is proposing in all regions partnerships or easy to use software so solutions to generate unique identifiers. Next slide. What is now tracking and tracing system? If we have uh, domestic systems, will we have a global tracking and tracing system? Well, Tracking and tracing is in the first place to have unique identifiers at pack level, including a serial number. However, this unique identifier should also be accessible outside the jurisdiction where the cigarettes have been produced. Otherwise, it will not be feasible to have a global system. Besides the unique identifier, you have a data carrier with some key information on the packs. Again, some of this uh, data carriers are protected and will not be accessible outside the jurisdictions so we need international standards to read these data carriers you need to have uh, you need in unique identifiers on pack level at carton level uh, master cases pallets you need aggregation again this is needed to have a global track and trace system the all the evidence during the supply chain should be stored in, in data storage companies um, and should be accessible and finally there should be an exchange of data between parties with what has been defined in article 8 of the illicit trade protocol the global information sharing focal point which should be responsible for the exchange of data next slide We, we have some problems uh, with traceability because time is running. Tracking and tracing obligations are entering into force in September 2023. That's in two years and a half. Half of the parties are low or middle income countries with lack of expertise and funding to establish a tracking and tracing system. We need also a decision on the global information sharing focal point. Uh, normally, they should have been taken at the pre at the first the second map uh, in the netherlands but this has been postponed uh, until this year we need also international standards because the different domestic systems have to communicate with each other following international standards and then we have to, to have uh, independent traceability software solutions to counter the initiatives of the tobacco industry next slide So we noticed that uh, there are many parties, for instance, in West Africa, 
but some of them will struggle to implement the ITP obligations in the context of huge tobacco industry interference. And um, Big Tobacco is proposing easy to use software to generate unique identifiers. So they will be there uh, to offer and help so-called the parties, but we need technical assistance independent of the industry. Next one. Also, it seems important to know that a global system is not the sum of domestic systems because we need to use the same standards. Here you see, for instance, an example of a unique uh, identifier, which is a combination of letters and numbers. And below a data carrier with key information. The key information is defined in Article 8 and is such information as date and location of the manufacturing, manufacturing facility, intended market of retails, and product description. This kind of information should be accessible at the moment of seizure. However, if it's not accessible, uh, it's only accessible with a do domestic application, it will not be accessible outside the jurisdiction. If the information is encoded or encrypted, you need to have decrypted tools or decoding tools. So you need absolutely to have international standards. Next slide. So in conclusion, eliminating the illicit cigarette trade might raise billions of dollars and could increase tax revenue from cigarette sales. It could be part of COVID-19 recovery strategy, raise taxes, eliminate illicit uh, cigarette trade is a win-win situation, both for health and revenue. Secondly, the strategy for technical and financial support for implementing the protocol requested by the first meeting of the parties and the establishment of the global tracking and tracing system requires some urgent decisions and we hope to see them at the end of the year at the next month. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luke. I must say it's a pleasure to always listen to you and to listen to somebody that has been involved on the protocol since its inception. So um, thank you very much for all our panelists. We are now going to answer the questions submitted. Please note that you can still submit questions via the questions pane. So my first question is actually to Hannah. Uh, and Hannah, we have a question here about how did you determine what was illicit tobacco in your research? And also, if you think that you still have opportunities to promote the importance of more uh, tax increases in, in South Africa. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, so how do we determine illicit? During the sales ban, it was easy. Everything was illicit. It was a ban on sale. Nobody was supposed to uh, sell. So anything that people bought was illicit. Um, when we don't have a sales ban, how do we determine illicit? So we had that uh, method of looking at the price of a pack of cigarettes. And if the price was less than tax that is supposed to be paid, we were um, marking that pack. We were saying that that pack is illegal because it, there is no way it could, um, it could pay the full tax. Uh, that method is now a little bit, you know, we cannot use it uh, as well as before because the prices change because of these opportunities that the manufacturers saw that they can actually charge higher prices. So the other way um, we can do it is to look at sort of a macro um, uh, level data, looking at how much um, uh, people consuming based on surveys and compare it with, with uh, legal sales. And that's called the gap method, and that's another way we can do it. And that was the method that when I showed the graphs about how much illicit trade was in South Africa over time, that was the method we used for that particular study. So right now, um, because the tax in South Africa, we don't, we don't have a tax stamp, you know, there's nothing on these packs. So if you, that, that would tell you if the pack is legal or not. 
So if you find a pack that is on, lying on a street or in the store, you don't know if the pack paid the tax or not. So that need to change. That need, that would come with the track and trace. And um, so what are the opportunities to increase tax? We're um, Our research unit is engaging with um, tax authorities and um, trying to convince them that they should... Uh, um, you know, they should be brave, more brave than they were until now to increase tax. But I think the window is only once a year when they discuss the budget. Um, but I think currently the tax increase is not really going to work well if we believe that, that the listed market could be as much as 50% now. So I think the first uh, order of an action is to have a, meth, a system that would control the illegal uh, market and that would be having a track and trace. So that's, I think, it's, it's our number one priority right now in South Africa. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Hannah. We have also a question here to Dr. Valavan. And Dr. Valavan, this question is related to the border between India and Bangladesh. And uh, we have a question here, uh, if you have any specific actions planned to uh, have more effective control uh, in this large border that India has with Bangladesh. No, we do have seizures uh, from uh, uh, on Myanmar borders and uh, uh, India and Bangladesh uh, in our Nepal borders also. But uh, as such, uh, uh, apart from our regular monitoring system and uh, issuing alerts and uh, keeping vigil, uh, we don't have any uh, specific action program to address as of now. Maybe uh, once this track and trace system comes, uh, some stringent measures may be put in place. Thank you very much, Dr. Valavan. Uh, Luke, we have also a question here uh, to you. And this is related to the fact that in your presentation, you spoke so much about the importance of countries acting in cooperation with each other. But uh, one of our participants thinks that countries are still working a lot uh, isolated. And uh, he has a question about the role of civil society, and especially regional and international civil society organizations, how they could support uh, that uh, countries could be working more in cooperation to promote the cooperation between countries. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, well, civil society has been a driving force behind the uh, FCTC and also be behind the uh, protocol. They should be collaborating at national levels, but they should follow some international standards. If you have, for instance, uh, a national traceability system, which is not, uh, which don't have markings for the export marking, export market. It's a problem because uh, then it will not resolve the international standards. Um, we have the data carriers. Uh, there are different data carriers which follow international standards. So that's very important. So there could be collaboration between the national NGOs and the national inter um, organization in charge of the implementing the protocol to see that we follow the guidance of the FCTC Secretariat and their experts to come up with some minimum standards in relation to accessibility of the unique identifiers, data carriers, um, that the export market is also included, that they include also aggregation. Um, that should be also important. Thank you, Luke. So I think I go back to Hannah now with another question, Hannah. We have a question here about the involvement of the tobacco industry in illicit trade. And if you believe that this represents a barrier for more effective work to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products, could you share your thoughts on this with us, please? Um, oh, yes, tobacco industry. Um, so we have a very uh, interesting and uh, 
what some of my colleagues see as a very exciting situation in South Africa because we have a group of international manufacturers and multinational tobacco companies, uh, primarily BAT and Philip Morris, and then the local manufacturers. And so we sort of um, throw sort of a dirt at each other in terms of who is responsible for this illicit market. Um, and both sides are guilty, of course, and we see it. We know that the local manufacturers are not paying all the, all the taxes. We know that already because of the, some of the prices that we currently see. We also see it because they're primarily their brands were available during the sales ban. So we have the channels to channel, uh, we have the illicit channels that they can uh, use. The multinationals, I think, were doing it a little differently. I think rather than, and um, I think we were doing it mostly through export. We're not quite, we're still investigating the data a little bit more to see how, what was actually going on, but we already see some evidence of some uh, excessive export that was, uh, um, that occurred during the sales ban. So of course, we were involved as well. Um, I think the problem here in South Africa is also that um, these, Big, uh, both big uh, multinationals and the local companies infiltrated the domestic political scenes. So they have relationship with policymakers, and it's really difficult to sort of um, sort it out and figure out how to now um, get rid of that of their influence because they have a lot of you know money, a lot of political influence, and that's definitely is making it very difficult in South Africa to move forward with the right solution to the crisis, and that's, illicit, uh, that's a track and, track and trace system. The system was already on, um, uh, it was already in commission as a, uh, there was a tender process, and it was already competition to do the tender and, and have the system yet, but it, um, but it, um, but it, uh, that system, it's sort of the, the whole process collapsed, and now there is no signs that the government wants to go back to, to start the system, the process again. So we do need to have somebody, we need to have a leadership in the government that would sort of take it as the, make it a priority and then, you know, continue with this process of, of uh, implementing tracking and tracing. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Dr. Valavan, uh, we have another question here to you. And uh, in the protocol, uh, there is a specific provision that uh, countries could uh, charge the costs of a tracking and tracing system to the tobacco industry, right? So uh, this should be a way of, of financing national tracking and tracing systems. And we have a question here, if this is something that India is considering to, to charge the tobacco industry for the costs of the, the tracking and tracing system. Yes, thank you. Uh, what we have recommended subject to approval uh, the thing uh, we largely adopted uh, the kenya model kenya per stamp they collect it from the industry so it is um, cost neutral for the government so the industry has to buy the 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 stamps from the government so basically pay in and covering the yes, cost yes 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 Thank you very much. So I think we are uh, running out of time, but I still have a last question to Luke. And Luke, this is a very interesting question. So uh, somebody noted that you made a lot of, and, and during the, the webinar, other panelists also made a lot of arguments on the economic benefits of implementing the protocol. But there was a question if we should not be talking about the health benefits of implementing the protocol, since you know the, the health impacts of tobacco use are, are very important. What are your views on this? So how 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 do you think is the best way for us to be promoting this protocol? Yes, but we are now in special times with problems of financial resources. So the reason why I stress uh, financial resources is countries are lacking of revenue and here we have a clear example where we have for instance the report of the World Bank. The World Bank says if you eliminate uh, illicit trade this is a win-win situation in the sense that you will base revenue and you will be less smokers. I stressed uh, the importance of 
of revenue because also decisions about implementing the protocol are not only made by health people but also by finance and customs people by governments um, so it's sure that it helps health health but in this case where everything is dominated by financing and resources it's also so important to stress not only that it raises uh, it's good for health because it, it's higher prices so less uh, sales but that it raises revenue no. thank you very much we have uh, some other questions that we will try to answer later but i just want to take this very few minutes to thank all the participants and thank all of our panelists for for this webinar speaking on behalf of the convention secretariat i must say uh, a big thank you to the union and the world conference on tobacco health committee for organizing this webinar uh, this protocol is still a, a very young let's say international instrument and uh, we still have to do a lot of work to promote it and to discuss in detail what is included in this protocol and how this protocol can support the achievement of health, economic, and many other sustainable development goals. I think that we, we can be looking at the issue of eliminating the trade as a development issue and as something that would uh, benefit uh, sustainable development as a whole. Uh, I think that we could see uh, during the presentations and the discussions that we had that the COVID-19 pandemic has, you know, for sure impacted the, 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 this, this context of illicit trade. So while we had countries like South Africa where, you know, given decisions that were made, we have seen uh, an increase on illicit trade. We also have countries like India where you see that, you know, the government is, is making efforts to go ahead and, and promote the implementation of this protocol. I think Luke presented to us very good arguments and all the, the opportunities and challenges that we have right now with this protocol. Uh, as Luke said, the governing body of the protocol, that is the meeting of the parties, was uh, postponed to November this year, but this meeting will happen this year. And I think that important decisions will be made that will guide countries to uh, their own you know, uh, efforts to, to implement the protocol and to be acting in, in cooperation with other countries to also implement this new international treaty. So thank you very much. And I think I, I give the floor now to Joanna. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo. And thank you to all our panelists who joined us today. Um, and for all the attendees who joined this last webinar of the series. These were organized by the Union and the 18th WCTOH Scientific and Track Committees. At the end of the session, you will receive a survey. Please don't hesitate to complete it because your feedback is important to us. The recording of this webinar will be available on the Union and the WCTOH YouTube channel. Registrants will receive an email with the link to access the recording. The registration for the Leadership Summit on Tobacco Control is still open. Visit our website www.wctoh.org to register. On behalf of the, of the WCTOH Secretariat, I would like to thank the WCTOH community for the continuous support throughout this webinar series. And we hope to engage with you soon in future events. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter to receive the latest updates about the Leadership Summit on Tobacco Control and other WC2H activities. Thank you all. Have a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening.